Fallout 4 changed the Fallout franchise in a number of big ways, but arguably the biggest change is in the game's weapon system. Every weapon can be modified to suit your playstyle, but there's a weapon that doesn't really fit in with the missile launchers, fully automatic rifles, and nuclear warheads. Can you beat Fallout 4 with only a Kami Whacker? I awoke in the bathroom and discovered how truly beautiful I am. The special setup for this run is relatively standard for a melee only playthrough. Lots of points and strength and endurance, some in luck to get the idiot savant perk later on, and the rest don't matter too much. After the Great War, I found the first problem. Because this is a Kami Whacker only playthrough, I can't use my fists or any of the weapons available in Vault 111. It wouldn't be so bad if the Rad Roaches weren't so damn annoying. You can't pick up a Pip-Boy if you're in combat. Put another way, you can't simultaneously pick up the Pip-Boy and be a tasty snack for the Roaches. Unfortunate. We could forego the Pip-Boy for a little while and glitch ourselves out of the vault, but that's too easy. Instead, I lured the Roaches down the hall, sprinted back through the door and out the other end of the hall, and closed the door behind me. Then I crouched, waited until I was hidden, picked up the Pip-Boy, and left the vault. Now, there's the issue of finding a Kami Whacker. Sure, I could just spawn one with console commands, but that's boring too. So, I'll have to travel to Nuka World to find one. The first thing I did was return to Sanctuary to get another special point. Then it was off to Nuka World. The recommended level to be at before you enter Nuka World is 30. I'm level 2. The journey to the DLC entrance was long and hard, just like the shaft of the Kami Whacker. The next issue is actually getting into Nuka World. There are gunners patrolling the area, not a big deal, but the Assault Tron is something to be concerned about. I ran inside the train station and got fucked to death by the Assault Tron's mouth. Why didn't I just use stim packs and run like hell? Because, my dear boy, I don't have any stim packs. I forgot them. After that shit show, I backtracked to Vault 111 to pick up a few stim packs that were lying around. But I knew that would not be enough. I'd need some sort of powered armor. On the way to said powered armor, I stole a lot of tomatoes from a farm. I let Preston kill the raiders outside the Museum of Freedom, picked up a fusion core, and left Preston to die in the Museum of Freedom as I ran to the roof and stole the power armor. I had armor, I had supplies, I had a pocket full of room temperature tomatoes, I had everything I'd need to get through Nuka World. The Assault Tron once again tried to get inside my pants, but the power armor protected me and hiding in the train station threw her off my trail long enough for me to restore power to the train and be on my way to the greatest amusement park ever devised. After arriving in Nuka World, I had to traverse the gauntlet of extreme pain, mayhem, and misfortune. All things being equal, it wasn't that bad. The wooden floor falling out was annoying, the turrets constantly shooting were a pain, and the gas room pissed me off because a bunch of roaches pinned me against the wall and tried to do things to my fanny. But I got through it all with only a few hundred scratches. Next came the boss battle, in which my only weapon was a squirt gun. And as you can probably imagine, this is where things took a very dark turn. In order to proceed, you must kill over boss Coulter. Luckily, the squirt gun does no damage, but there is no way around this fight. To answer the titular question, no, you can't beat Fallout 4 with only a Kami Whacker, because you can't get a Kami Whacker without killing someone with something that isn't a Kami Whacker. Well, it's not the end of the world. I've had runs in the past with a single segment that can't be beaten, like the Guilty Spark fight in Halo 3. So, I decided to say F the system and kill over Boss Coulter. I had a Switchblade, which could be a suitable replacement, but my thinking was that if it's not a Kami Whacker, it doesn't really matter what it is. I used an assortment of the weapons I picked up to lay Coulter to rest, became the new overboss, entered the new cocade, and finally found my Kami Whacker. It's as beautiful as I thought it would be. Actually, that was a lie, because the textures on it are shitty. Probably a result of the mods I have installed that up the resolutions of the game files. Oh well, with an inflatable mallet in my hand, I left Nuka World forever and returned to the Commonwealth to bonk some skulls. The first thing I did with my newfound power was enter the Museum of Freedom to kill the raiders because I'd need the Minutemen later on to enter the Institute. I also learned that the Kami Whacker sounds just like every other melee weapon. I was hoping for a squeak or something, not the sound of a tire iron slamming on pavement like all the other weapons. Lame. After freeing the trapped settlers, I was off to Diamond City. Along the way, I settled the cats versus dog debate when I killed both a cat and a dog. I also entered ArcJet Systems for some reason, and discovered that the Institute hadn't been there yet, so there was nothing in there for me to do. 
before I found Diamond City, I passed by Park Street Station, so I saved some time by going down into the subway station to free Nick Valentine. The Trigger Men fought valiantly, but none are a match for Mr. Mandelbaum and his mallet. With Nick Valentine free, the only thing standing between me and leaving Park Street Station are Skinny Malone and his gang of hooligan fooligans. I pumped myself full of chems and beat the fuck out of all of them with me mallet. Here's the cool part about rescuing Nick before going to Diamond City. You don't have to listen to Piper argue with the security guy. You can just walk right in and ignore Piper on your way to Nick's office. But before entering Nick's office, I sold every weapon and bullet I had to get an ample supply of stim packs and right away, as well as a chest piece that gave plus one to both agility and perception. And I did keep the squirt gun because I will never part with that. After describing to Nick my situation, I bribed the mayor's assistant to get a key to Kellogg's office. I took Nick as a companion and after an incredible journey together that lasted maybe five seconds, we parted ways when I left to follow Dogmeat as he tracked down Kellogg. Dog Steak led me to Fort Hagen where, again, Dog Ham followed me inside despite me telling him to piss off back to where he came from. With the perks and armor I had, the synths weren't much of a challenge. Though they were annoying at times, because melee combat in Fallout 4 sucks, I used the same tactic with Kellogg as I did with Skinny Malone, which was Kems and me mallet. After thoroughly searching every pocket Kellogg had, and I do mean every pocket, I returned to Diamond City and spoke to Nick and Piper about what to do next. They agreed that going to Good Neighbor was the most okay-ish option available. And when I arrived at Good Neighbor, I introduced Finn to my mallet. The two got to know each other pretty well. Then I entered Kellogg's brain and ate a shitty microwave breakfast sandwich while Sparkles did his thing. Next came the glowing sea. I bought a hazmat suit, stored some stuff in Sanctuary, and was off to Virgil's cave. The children of Adam might have looked at me funny. I don't know because I couldn't see through the hazmat suit, but I assumed that they did and killed them all. Then I got the plans from Virgil and fast traveled back to CIT ruins where I ignored the radio station and ventured towards Green Tech Genetics. The suicidal bitch with a rocket launcher was, as the name suggests, a bitch to deal with, but the rest of the gunners inside were cake manure. I approached the courser with extreme caution and looked on in amazement as a battle took place between two invisible people. I assume it was incredible, I couldn't tell what was going on, but in the end, the courser died as did the hostages, and I was told by Dr. Amari to find the railroad. I knew what she meant. She pretty much begged me to kill the railroad, which is what I did. Glory was the only one who posed an actual threat. Pam could have been tough, but she ran away when I started bonking her on the head. I then analyzed the Corsair chip myself, got the plans from Virgil again, and returned to the Museum of Freedom to talk to Sturgis. But I couldn't get Sturgis to look at the plans until they were at Sanctuary and I couldn't get them to go to Sanctuary until the raiders outside the museum were dead. Luckily, by doing things in the weird order that I did, the Brotherhood were in the area and proved to be great at being bait for both the raiders and the Deathclaw. I only had to pick off a few raiders before I talked to Preston and discovered that a settlement needs my help. I helped them alright, I helped them by ending their worthless lives. I told Preston that they weren't interested in joining the Minutemen. He rambled on about dead people or something, and finally, the topic shifted from being all about him to all about me when he asked me about the plans I mentioned earlier. Sturgis looked at the plans, I built all the science mumbo jumbo, and emailed myself inside the Institute. As you may have guessed, by my lack of doing stuff for other factions, I decided to side with the Institute this time around. As disappointing as it was to see that my son looks nothing like me, I pushed onward and met with the people in charge of things in the Institute and got my first mission, track down a rogue synth and bring it home. I would have preferred to not do this in a radiation storm, but when do I ever get what I want? The mission was a success, and father drowned me in his thick, creamy praise. The synth re-getting mission was more like a practice round than anything important, as what came next was the Battle of Bunker Hill. Lots of fighting, lots of death, my kind of party. You're supposed to run around the back side of Bunker Hill, but I didn't want to do that so I jumped on a bus and hopped the fence, fought my way past a few Brotherhood Knights, and used the four reset codes to put the synths in sleep mode. I spoke to Father atop CIT Ruins, it was a real bitch to get up there by the way, and then we spoke again inside the Institute where he gave me the best present a father could ask for. My son has a terminal illness and is going to die. I couldn't be happier because I don't think he's actually my son. He doesn't have my nose or my horribly mutated vomit-inducing facial features. Regardless, we have work to do. 
Well, I have work to do. He's getting busy with the dying and whatnot. I transmitted to Mass Fusion, where I bonked a lot of Brotherhood scribes with me mallet and retrieved the beryllium agitator. And then came the robots. Fucking machines. With the help of a stealth boy, I was able to land a few sneak hits on the sentry bot, but the Assaultrons must have been friends of Pam, because they were not nice to me. Some time ago, I had installed a few blades on my inflatable mallet. Probably not the smartest idea I've ever had, but they came in handy here, because the Assaultrons bled like the robotic, humanoid dogs they are. I traveled back to the Institute, gave the agitator to, uh, whatever her name is, and was told by father that there was something I needed to do to a house, or in a house, or something. I followed the waypoint and had to convince some little shit stain to come out of the closet and travel with scientists to an underground bunker with unfathomable technology where they assured he'd be safe. The end is near. I can smell it in my giant fucking nose. I returned to the Institute and delivered a message to the Commonwealth. Then I went to Diamond City and did the thing with the buttons and the dials and the switches to beef up the transmitter. I then activated the reactor in the basement to ensure that I'd be able to heat up my chicken nuggets in the event of a power outage, and received word of the last step. The Brotherhood of Steel must be destroyed. I was transported just outside the airport and was tasked with infiltrating the base and destroying three generators. I did it with unimaginable grace. There was little to no wasted motion. Every swing of my mallet calculated and executed with ungodly precision. Just kidding. I closed my eyes and swung wildly at the big metal men. All that's left is to infect Liberty Prime with communist propaganda and the victory will be claimed in the name of science. The Brotherhood sent everything they had at me in the sense. Even Elder Maxon arrived on the scene. I'm not sure what happened to him. I think he slipped and fell off the roof or something. Regardless, I was teleported, against my will mind you, away to safety where I watched the Pridwin go down in flames. Pridwin? More like Prid was. Get it? Get it? Get it? Well, that's pretty much it for this adventure. I spoke to father one last time, though this time I took off my sunglasses and donned my sea captain's cat as a sign of mutual respect between myself and this old man who clearly isn't my son. The game ended, and I did not beat Fallout 4 with only a commie whacker. I almost did though, and maybe the real commie whacker was the friend I made along the way. And that's gonna do it for this video about whether or not you can beat Fallout 4 with only a- with what? With only a commie worker. If you enjoyed the video or learned anything, leave a like. Leave a dislike if you didn't enjoy the video or didn't learn anything. Follow me on Twitter at Mitten Squad. My name is Paul of Mitten Squad. Have a wonderful day.